My name's Pastor Roger, and I'm here with Kathy D'Souza, our missionary friend, who are missionaries Joe and Jemima Okren in uh, Ghana, West Africa. Joe uh, told me that uh, COVID has uh, not affected Ghana in a very huge way, according to the statistics he had, only about 300 active cases exist in, in the country and the hospitals are currently able to handle the care of, of the patients. Um, most of our, a lot of our churches are in rural areas and the rural areas are not uh, affected as much due to their isolation. Um, the churches are all open, the Wesleyan churches of Ghana. Uh, the government has placed uh, a maximum number of 200 on the, the number of persons who can be in the building and a two-hour maximum time frame for services. Four months ago, we asked uh, you people to give to uh, Veronica Buckets, which are hand-washing stations for the schools in Ghana, and the response was tremendous. Thank you so much. They have been delivered. So now what I want to ask is, Kathy, what is the greatest need right now, number one, in the school in Duwakwa, and secondly, in the new uh, Edubowase uh, computer lab? So the greatest need um, in du at Duwakwa School is for additional desks in order for students to be, um, to be able to sit separately because of COVID. And the cost for the desks to be built is $30 Canadian for a single desk or $50 Canadian for double desks. These desks are wooden and they are built uh, by craftspeople in Ghana. At least 50 desks will be needed at Duwakwa, so that, that is our goal right now, uh, to assist them in that way. At New Ejibiase, the computer lab and library is almost ready to open. A few things are still remaining to be purchased. Uh, tables, some chairs, um, additional books, reference books, surge protectors for the computers, an internet modem, and a printer copier. We are unable this fall to host our annual spaghetti dinner fundraiser and silent auction to raise funds for Ghana. However, you can still give. If you visit our website, centennialroad.com, you can go to the Give tab, and if you select the Donate button, you can choose the Missions option. Uh, give there and we're so grateful for your faithfulness. As well, you can e-transfer our financial administrator at Donna Ray at centennialroad.com to help support the ministry there. Please continue to pray for Joe and Jemima and the work of Project Reach Out in Ghana, uh, for the pastors and the churches. And as uh, school will be reopening in January of 2021, um, I know that they will covet your prayers for the teachers, the students, and all the families involved in the schools uh, that Project Reach Out is running in Ghana. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. Whether you're here in person or tuning in online, we're so grateful that you are here. And if you are online or on demand, what we want you to do right now is like and share this video on your social media platform of choice and get the message out there. That message is a message of hope. I'm so glad to see all of you here. Let me see those smiles. They're wonderful. The best thing for me about wearing a mask is nobody knows whether or not I've brushed my teeth in the morning. I'm the only one that pays the price. That recycled air, it's wonderful. Hey, a couple of things that I wanna get you in on the know of. First of all is this, it's a proud day for the Frizzell family because we have our first teenager in the house. Our daughter's 13. And so from this moment forward, I'm going to start balding. So just so you know, that is gonna happen. Another thing that I'm really excited about is we don't, we don't always get the opportunity to be generous abroad, but we also get the opportunity to be generous right where we are. And one of the things that you can do to partner with what God is doing here in our city is by helping us create care kits for our homeless population. 
The season is changing whether we like it or not. Fishing is coming to an end. Boating is coming to an end. The cold weather is starting to creep in incrementally. And we want to do our part just to love and care for our citizens to the best of our ability. So again, if you want more information, you can go to our website or give us a call here in the office and we can direct you in how to get involved in that initiative. The last quick thing, kids age three to grade three, if you're here today, something special just for you. We're launching a kid's experience during our Sunday morning gatherings. Pastor Roger will give you some more information about that and what you need to do and where you need to go in just a few short minutes. So stay tuned, kiddos. It's going to be an awesome day. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, we are so grateful and thankful for who you are. I celebrate along with Joe and Jemima that you are doing some great, incredible things in Ghana. I pray that I, I am so thankful that you are keeping people safe in the midst of this global pandemic. And sometimes we forget that it is impacting the entire world, not just our region or not just our livelihood in some way, shape, or form. And so, Jesus, we ask you to bring calm where it needs to be calm, bring restoration where it needs to be restored, and above all, would you invite people to know you personally in a deep and meaningful way. As we launch into this series today called Keeping On, Keeping On, Father, I just have this sense that you are wanting us as a community to understand what it means to continue to walk forward despite the chaos that surrounds us. And would you allow us to experience you in a deep and meaningful way today? We pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. Would you stand and worship with us this morning?
Like you, I was born destined for death because of sin. Sin is anything that goes against God, who is perfectly just and good. We've all sinned, and the result is separation from God. That is true death. God desires restoration. He sent Jesus, who is both God and man, perfect in every way. Being perfect, Jesus died for my sins, paying the debt I couldn't pay, repairing the separation between me and God. By his death, I am made clean. I am a new creation. The unbearable weight of my sin is gone, and I can begin a new life free from sin and true death. This is only the beginning. Because of who Jesus is and what he's done for me, I choose to follow him. My outward self is washed as a display of my inward faith. I eagerly give him my obedience, declaring this gift to the world. God refuses to leave me scarred by sin. His desire is for me to have the humility, kindness, and love of Jesus, to fight the temptation, pride, and laziness of my old self. 
Knowing this world is still broken, I cling to the hope that is coming. When I am with God, finally home. And this hope I have in a future with Jesus brings me great joy. This is what God has done. I deserve death. Jesus died in my place. I am made clean. In obedience, I follow him. I grow in faith and my future hope brings new life. This is amazing grace. This is the gospel. The gospel. Well, our children age three to grade three are going to learn about the gospel with a special activity in the boulevard this morning. So uh, you are released uh, if your parents so choose, age three to grade three. Well, it's 2020, and if Paul the Apostle were alive today and were a media man, this is the type of uh, thing he would create, explaining the gospel that we were destined first for death, but by the blood of Jesus, he saves us. We have salvation and we're made clean so that we can then follow Jesus all the days of our life. We can grow in godliness through his Holy Spirit until our final day, our hope, our forever in heaven. That is the gospel. And the good news was that everything and the only thing that Paul ever preached and promoted. So if anyone ever twisted it or confused it or perverted it, he would get pretty ticked off at them. He was not a happy camper. And we are actually going to be looking at that reality in the next six weeks as we look at the book of Galatians, which we've called Keep On Keeping On. There are six chapters. And so uh, for six Sundays, we will look at one chapter each Sunday. And what your pastors are going to do is maybe concentrate on just a couple verses in the chapter and then leave it to you to dig in to the rest of the chapter throughout the rest of the week. Now, why? Why are we doing this? Well, because like Paul, we want you to walk in freedom, to walk in the liberty that Christ has attained for us. We do not want you to be bound by anything that might hinder you from the freedom that we are to experience in Christ. And that pastoral spirit that Paul had, that kind of fatherly role, is the same spirit that your pastors have for you. We want you walking in freedom. So, as I set this table, as it were, for the next six weeks, um, let me explain that this is one of Paul's most direct letters. It's kind of a scathing letter in some ways. Um, he has ticked off at what has been happening in his congregations in Galatia. And just like any protective pastor or protective father, he is now reading the riot act to them. This letter is kind of a cuff upside the head. It's a boot in the backside for these people to get it right. And this essence of chapter one that we're looking at today is Christ above all. He's got to be numero uno. Jesus has got to be number one, and he's reminding his people about that. Now, because of what Paul has to deal with, because of what his, his people are beginning to believe, and because of the people who are infiltrating and bringing these, this false message, he has to start off by naming his credentials. And he does it this way in Galatians 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers and sisters with me. I, there it is. This is quite an impressive list of who is addressing 
the Galatian church. Paul, who is not coming by man's authority, but by God's authority. And as if God's authority wasn't enough, he's also coming on the authority of all the brothers and sisters with him. Essentially, the whole church, the local church at Jerusalem, they are backing him up. They're equally concerned for what's happening in Galatia. Well, at this point in history, Paul is writing from the holy capital. It's around the time of the Council of Jerusalem, so 49 AD. He's got the credentials, something unfortunately he has to appeal to in the writing of this letter because of what they're starting to believe. Let's look at it. Galatians 1, verses 3 and 5. To the, to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, that is the extent of the warmth of his greeting. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. So he is reiterating the relationship that they have with God the Creator and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's reiterating the Lordship of Jesus in their lives. Here's the first part of the true gospel. Who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. This is the basis of the gospel. Jesus did it for us. We cannot eliminate our own sins. We can't even try. We don't have the capacity. We don't have the ability except to depend upon Jesus. Paul had already laid that foundation and now he's reminding them of the truths that he taught them not that long ago when they first believed the gospel. Jesus is Lord. Christ above all. He is numero uno. He has got to be everything. He is everything that we need according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. And glory belongs to God for salvation, not to man for salvation. And so that's his introduction. Now, in all of his other letters, he then goes on to thanking them for what he's witnessed in their lives. Not so with the Galatian church. In every other letter, he thanks them for their support of the gospel, for their partnership in the gospel, for their generosity, for whatever it is that he has witnessed in their lives. But to the Galatian church, he offers no thanksgiving. He gets right to the spanking. He gets right into expressing how incredulous it is that they are believing what they're now believing. In verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. How can it be? Paul's astonishment, his amazement with them is actually filled with lots of angst. In fact, the Amplified Translation of the Bible says it this way, I am astonished and extremely irritated. That's the sense of what he's saying. And he's not flying off the handle here. The fact is he's writing a letter. He is choosing his words to reflect his emotions very carefully. He's not having a fit. He is expressing himself very carefully. Clearly. And one theologian writes this, the Greek word thamauzo, meaning I am amazed, was a conventional expression in Greek letters that signaled astonishment, rebuke, disapproval, and disappointment. And so we get this picture here that Paul is bearing his heart. He is sharing all of his emotions. He's not holding back on what he's been feeling. Now, have you ever had your dad yell at you for something stupid that you did? Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. 
And we know dad loves us, but he's yelling at us because of some idiotic thing that we did to get us back on the straight and narrow. Have you ever been the dad who's yelled at his kids for something stupid? <laughs> We've got some pointing fingers here, so thank you for your honesty. It's the, I can't believe you did this. Are you stupid? What the bleep were you thinking? I know. And Paul says this, I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. You're giving up on God? What? You're abandoning the one who calls you to live by grace? For another way? Which is really no gospel at all? Are you nuts? And you know, sometimes people, when we're on that good and glorious path, as, as wonderful as it is, sometimes veer off it because someone else is influencing us. They have planted a seed of doubt, or they've planted a, a thought or a theology that appeals to us, and we get, we get off that narrow path. Paul's words in verse 7, which is really no gospel at all, evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. So what was happening is this. There were certain outsiders who came to town and they were infiltrating the churches in Galatia. And this new different gospel was really bad news. Teachers of false doctrine who were stirring up unrest had followed Paul. And Dr. Thomas Constable of the Dallas Theological Seminary, he writes this, these false teachers were distorting the good news of Christ by putting pressure on Gentiles to believe and to live as religious Jews. That's what's going on here. And Dr. Constable says, to attempt to change the gospel has the effect of making it the very opposite of what it really is. This is important to see. And he uses this illustration. You have a glass of water. It's refreshing. It's pure. It's life-giving. And you drop in two drops of arsenic. It's still clear, it doesn't look different, it doesn't taste different, but it is no longer life-giving. It is life-taking. And that's what's happening here. Now, Paul was aghast to think that the gospel of grace, freedom in Christ, would be willingly substituted by a false gospel, a salvation by works, adding uh, rule-keeping. To their lives. Now, I want to be clear. There are indeed behaviors and actions to avoid, as well as behaviors and actions for us to add, to adopt as believers. I think of my own life. So, I gave my life to Christ almost 40 years ago when I was a teenager. I would hope that in the span of 40 years, um, I have improved in my Christian walk. And I'll tell you, one of the first things that God did in my life was clean up my language. I, I needed to clean up my language, and that's what he convicted me of, and that, that's what I worked on. I, I need to subtract bad language out of my life. I also needed to add generosity. He was teaching me how to give, how to give liberally. So these types of subtractions and additions actually do help us follow Jesus better. But they're not required to get into heaven. I didn't have to clean up my language in order to be acceptable to Jesus. He already accepted me. So that's the difference. And Paul's going to talk to the Galatians about these types of things later in the letter. But what he is first establishing in chapter 1 is belief. What do you believe about salvation? What you believe about salvation will indeed affect your behaviors. And conversely, our behaviors will point 
to what we really believe. And Paul wants them to stick with Christ is number one, numero uno, Christ above all. It's all about Jesus. And so for his congregations to stray away from that truth, it's really ticking him off. It's upsetting him to the point that he has some very strong words for proponents of a different gospel. In verses 8 and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we've already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than the one that you accepted, let them be under God's curse. This is very strong language. In common vernacular, it's like Paul is saying, if someone is teaching a false gospel, well, they can just go to beep, you know. That's what he's saying, very strong language. And this is the importance of staying true to Christ's gospel. And if you are straying away from Christ above all, Jesus number one, smarten up boot in the pants. Do not desert the creator who called you to live in the grace of Christ. And if you're teaching that sort of thing, will God's curse be upon you? That's what he's dealing with. So let me ask you this. Have you ever been in a relationship or a situation, a circumstance where you had to get dramatic or someone had to get dramatic and it maybe it's others in the circle were were not listening they're not hearing maybe they're fearful complacent and someone gets dramatic to get their point across for a major shakeup or have you ever been the person to be dramatic to get your point across not me that's not part of my nature you know i would never get dramatic to get my point across <laughs> <laughs> that is what is happening with Pastor Paul, the apostle, this missionary to the Galatians. They've got his heart. And he's calling these Gentile converts back to the truth. And he's calling out the wretches who are teaching a false gospel, things that are contrary to grace. And the fact is, Paul used to be like those very people. If we skip ahead in this chapter, we see him explain his personal experience in verse 13. For you've heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Paul knew what it was like to be a rule follower. Grace was foreign to him, and any righteousness that he thought he had, he was trying to earn it through his actions, through keeping strict regulations. And then he met Jesus. Then he met Jesus. And he came into this radical experience of knowing grace so that everything else that he had ever known, every man-made attempt at salvation and righteousness, uh, redemption, that just became junk for the garbage heap. He says that. Paul came into the reality that grace through Jesus Christ, above all, was all that anybody ever needed. He goes on to say, They only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. That's what we want. Paul knew the power of the gospel, what it could do for him. And it compelled him to travel all over the ancient world to share the good news, so that when people would come after him and trade out that message of freedom for one of bondage, well, yeah, he got upset. It ticked him off. It was heartbreaking for him. 
And the, tr- and the same is true for us today. We want you to walk in freedom, to bask in grace, to stick with Christ above all. Jesus is number one. Make sure he is your numero uno. Now, as we continue to look at the book of Galatians, we're going to have to sort through the stuff that only God can do. We'll sort through the stuff that we can participate with God in. It's when those lines get blurred that people get into trouble. That's what happened with the first century church in Galatia. The lines were getting blurred. So again, let me quote from Dr. Constable. He uses a unique illustration to help us with some issues of theology, just like the Galatians. He says, I sometimes compare the Christian life to a three-stage Saturn rocket. Now, I have a Lego version for us to look at today. The first stage, justification, is an act of God alone, in which he starts us on our journey to a different world. In justification, it happens in a moment of time when a person trusts in his or her Savior for their salvation. The second stage, sanctification. This is also a work that God does, but which Christians can cooperate in by continuing to trust and obey him, or they can resist by saying no to him. Christians play a part in their sanctification. Now, in our practical sanctification, we're moving away from where we have been to where we're going, to where we will be spiritually. And the third stage is glorification. And this, again, is a work of God alone, and it takes place in a moment of time. Just like justification, in this case, we finally touch down at our final destination spiritually. Now, we don't need to do anything to qualify for glorification. God will glorify every Christian. Regardless of how far we have advanced in our sanctification. And glorification for Christians takes place at either the rapture of the church or at death, whichever occurs first. So justification and glorification are totally acts of God. Sanctification is an act of God that we get to participate with. Now, some people don't have time for sanctification. And I don't mean that facetiously. I mean that quite literally. I'm thinking of deathbed conversions, for instance. People are in their last hours of life. They recognize that they need to submit to a savior. They pray, they offer their lives to Jesus, and they are justified. And within a short time, they're glorified. They literally have no time for sanctification. Another example that occurred to me was the thief on the cross. When they were being crucified with Jesus, one of the thieves recognized his sinfulness and Christ's righteousness and turned to him and said, will you remember me? He recognized he ought not to be crucified, but he was paying his own penalty. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. That fellow was justified and hours later glorified. No time for sanctification. But other people... We have a lifetime to cooperate with God regarding sanctification. So for those examples of people who give their lives to Christ when they're four, or 14, or 34, or 64, and live to 94, that's a chunk of time where we get to participate with God in our sanctification. And what Paul is emphasizing is that our works, they do not ready us for heaven. Only Jesus' work on the cross does that for us. It's not about our works. It's about God's work. Paul had already been an expert in following the rules, but it couldn't save him. So it broke his heart that the Galatian believers were straying from the gospel path 
to a works-based path. And he was imploring them to some course correction, to keep on keeping on, to get back to the gospel of grace, not works. So let me conclude with this. Some works are valuable to prove what we believe, to substantiate what God has done in our lives. Other works are just a waste of time and of energy and frankly can be an enemy of the gospel. That's what Paul was dealing with. That's the application for us today. So as the next six weeks unfold, I pray that you will dig in and that the truth of the gospel will grip our hearts, that it will change our minds, that it will influence our behaviors wherever Jesus wants to do that in us. And today, I want to ask you to examine what you believe about salvation. What do you believe about salvation? Are you striving to be good enough? Hoping that your good deeds will outweigh your bad deeds and somehow earn you a ticket into heaven. That is not salvation. Salvation is trusting that Christ's sacrifice was enough, that you are saved by faith and by trusting in Jesus. So rest in that grace. Relax in that freedom. And, and rather than striving to qualify yourself for heaven, let any works you do be the result of gratitude for what God has already accomplished. So examine your beliefs and align them with the true gospel. I'm going to ask you to stand and let's pray together. Father in heaven, I pray that you help us gain a grasp of the true gospel. That though we are destined for death, your son Jesus is our rescue. And we put all of our faith in him, our redeemer, our Lord, our savior. Teach us what it is to walk in the freedom you have gained for us. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
Thank you that we don't have to earn our way to you. God, we believe that you sent your son to die for us and to raise again so that we could know you. Help us to know who you say we are. Help us to walk as though we are free. Walk as though we belong to you. We believe that when Jesus rose from the dead, he defeated the darkness once and for all. And we believe that there is power in the name of Jesus. And so God, today we pray in the name of Jesus for healing. We pray in the name of Jesus for reconciliation and redemption. We pray in the name of Jesus for victory. We pray in the name of Jesus against fear, against lies of the enemy, pray in the name of Jesus for peace. We pray in Jesus' name that those in our lives that don't know you would come to know you, God. God, as we continue to worship, I pray that each person here would know and believe that there is power in your name. And that no matter what we may be facing today, we can claim victory because you have already won and it is already ours. God, would you continue to change us? We pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus.
the Spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. say thank you for your continued generosity as you continue to support our faith community it allows our community here to inspire the greater Brockville region with hope so we say thank you for your time your talent and your treasure this provides us the opportunity to tell the people of this region that God loves them that he has a plan for them and that he indeed is real. Today, I'm excited to share with you that there's a unique opportunity for you to give. This opportunity is called Trunk or Treat. It is our 12th annual Trunk or Treat, but this year we've tweaked it a little bit in our recent season. And so it's a drive-through Trunk or Treat experience. An amazing opportunity has come to us to provide two locations. So there'll be a location right here at Sea Road for the Brockville region, and there'll be a location located in Prescott at O'Reilly's, your independent grocer parking lot. God has brought alongside us some amazing community partners. In Prescott, we're coming alongside Youth for Christ, and we're providing an opportunity in a really challenging season to show who God is, shine the light of Jesus, 
and inspire hope. So October 31st at both locations, we invite you to join the team as we celebrate hope, family fun, and community. There are a number, ways, number of ways that you can join the team. We're still recruiting people to join our trunk team. We've been, look, we've been working closely with our local health unit to make sure that all safety and health measures are in place. You can donate candy because Trunk or Treat always needs candy. So if you have an opportunity to support us in that way, there are bins throughout the community as well here at Sea Road. Rockville, locations for candy collection are Canadian Tire and Giant Tiger. And in Prescott, Canadian Tire and O'Reilly's Independent Grocer. There's a few other ways that you can partner with us. We're looking for people to help us with traffic flow and during the weeks to come, help us fill some bags of treats for all of the community families. And last but definitely not least, we ask you to join us in prayer that hope in the light of Jesus would shine so bright on October 31st, people will be drawn to ask questions about who God is. We just want to wish you a fantastic week. You may be dismissed.